But um, yeah, and Hans were, am I correct with that? Hans was a huge, Hans and Yev were huge, were two huge people who were involved in curating this. So how about a um, round of applause? Uh, next semester, same thing. Uh, a, a really uh, incredible and interesting and diverse lineup of speakers and artists. So please look at the Artist Now schedule for the spring semester. And this carries on to next year and so on. So all students in my class, by all means, uh, if you've enjoyed uh, the Wednesday night experience of hearing artists, you can simply go online and you know, look at the, the, the look at the artist's name. You can look up their work, see if it intrigues you. Uh, there's some really, really intriguing work coming next semester, and and Yev and Hans do a great job of taking in all the recommendations from uh, the art art design faculty and bringing in intriguing and interesting people. So uh, spread the word. Uh, it's obviously a lecture ser series that's free and open to the public, but next semester it also will be a Art 309 class as well. So students in the general university population can obviously register for Art 105, which is about 100 students, or well, we're about 80 students or so in my class from Art 105. That will run, but art students can also take the class for Art 309 Club the credit as well. So I'm hoping and expecting that many, many of the art students will be here and in this class. And so spread the word, art students. Spread the word that um, this is an interesting uh, class for you to get art credit. And just so you know what happens, it's not just uh, listening to Artists Now talks. Uh, there is a reading and writing uh, component with this class where I assign uh, interesting readings about contemporary artists. Uh, you folks, the students are writing about it. And then after the uh, lecture series concludes, which it usually concludes around 8.30, then my class meets for another hour. And some of the best conversations I've had about art in any academic setting is in this class. And the reason being is all the, the, uh, the range of majors where you have students from all majors and all walks of life talking about art, its impact, and visual culture. It's a really fascinating experience. So uh, I invite and welcome the uh, art students to enroll at, in Art 309. So without further ado, uh, Bruce from Innova will introduce our guest tonight. Thanks, uh, Nicholas, and congratulations on winning another Noel Fellowship. <laughs> Second one. Uh, I'm the director of the Unova Gallery, um, and I'd like to invite you to see the current Noel Fellows. Uh, that shows up until December 4th. Make sure you check it out. Uh, we're closed over Thanksgiving, but you have a few days yet. Um, I um, am very pleased to introduce um, we've known each other for quite a while, since the mid-90s, I think. Uh, Martha showed at the Michael Gore Gallery when he was a really important dealer in town. He showed a lot of international and national artists and a lot of important <coughs> artists um, before he went to jail. So <laughs> that's another, another story. Um, but uh, I was very pleased to have the show She showed at the Liston Gallery in Lawrence. Uh, her show at the Charles Alice uh, just ended. Um, but I've uh, had a natural affinity and an admiration for Martha's work ever since I met her. I think we've become really good friends. Uh, we worked together on a project uh, called Starry Transit that she's not going to talk about tonight, but it was a real pain in the ass. It was like a Washburn Observatory in, in UW Madison. Um, at UW-Madison, got her MFA there later on. Um, her, make sure to see her work at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Local, local. she'll talk about that. Uh, Martha is currently the director of the Wisconsin Academy's James Watchers Gallery, where she's uh, also a curator, exhibit designer, fundraiser, and everything. Yeah, floor cleaner. Floor cleaner. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Martha Bolay. Is that good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. The 
reason Bruce thought doing starry transit was such a, quote, pain in the ass was it was in the dome of the Washburn Observatory at campus, this 1870s building, and he had to figure out how to haul, he was my comparator, and he had to figure out how to haul really fragile artwork up a really narrow staircase <coughs> with two landings. I think that was the main problem, right? Yes. <laughs> Nothing to do with me personally. No. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. This is um, a treat for me to give a talk here. I've attended several of these Art Now talks over the years, so it's, it's fun to come and present for you. And I also really thank Yev yeah, for inviting me and Bruce for inviting me to have a show this summer. It was, it was wonderful to have a show here. Some of the work that I'll talk about tonight was in the show at over the summer, so if some of you saw that, you'll recognize the work and I can tell you a little bit about it. I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes. I really, it makes me less nervous if I'm a little less formal, so if you have questions and want to ask me questions as we go along, I would really welcome that and hope that we have some time at the end for some questions as well, if you would like to do that. I'm at the point now in my life as an artist, I've been working as a professional artist for more than 30 years. So I've been starting to really look back and try to figure out what's been important to me. And I realize that there are several things that have really remained constant for me that really drive my work as an artist. One of those is that I use my work to expand my knowledge about the world and to communicate with other people. I think most, peop most artists really do want to communicate with other people, but to me, art is really a reason for me to do, do research and to learn about new things. So I really do spend a lot of time, if I get ideas for work, meeting people and going into the library. I live outside of Madison, the university system has very rich libraries and things that I'm interested in, so I spend a lot of time doing research. I also use my work to indulge my strong need for making things by hand. Exploring and inventing new processes are an important part of my art practice. My background, my graduate degree was in metalsmithing, where you really, I think I gravitated towards that because I really wanted to learn how to make things. And that whole mindset has been very important to me, whether I work in metal, and you'll see now I work in a lot of different media but making things is very important to me. I also realize now that many of the things that interest me both intellectually and emotionally as a mature artist are the same things that interested me when I was nine and when I was a young adult. These interests include natural history, photography, and collecting. In this talk, I'm going to show examples of work and talk about the visual and written sources that have influenced me in making it. Most of these sources come from the natural world and from the history of science, museums, and collections. I have to sit down. It's been a day. Okay, so. Let's see. Oh, wait a minute. I have to go into slideshow, don't I? Come on, baby. Bottom of the screen, the little screen, screen thing. This is a way different PowerPoint than this. Oh, wait, from there. Oh, thank you. Technology, my friend. I want to start by showing you a group of slides that have influenced me. And the first group of slides I'm going to show you are based on collecting the history of museums and cabinets of curiosities along with images that have influenced me in um, <coughs> thinking about how I want to approach building my own cabinets of curiosities. So I'm going to start, there we go, with a few examples of cabinets of curiosities. Cabinets of curiosities are kind of in the wind these days. I, I got interested in them probably 1990, 1995, and started reading about the history of museums. But I'm finding there are a lot more people who know about them now, and there are other contemporary artists who are working in this, in this vein. This 
image of Ole Worm's cabinet is one that probably is most familiar to people who have done some reading about cabinets of curiosities. Worm was part of a strong collecting tradition that developed in Denmark during the 17th century within both the nobility and the scientific community. He was a professor of classics, natural philosophy, and medicine at the University of Copenhagen and published a catalog of a collection right around the time that, that he died in 1654. This image was reproduced as a contemporary artist rendition of the cabinet a few years ago. I don't know if any of you saw it. I'm trying to remember what museum it was in, but it was in the East Coast. And I thought that was a, a very interesting project to attempt. One of my favorite cabinets is this one by Levinas Vincent. He wrote and self-published a description of his collection in 1706. This was kind of the heyday of the 1600s and, and late 1500s into early 1700s. That was the heyday of the cabinets. His description consisted of a series of eight engravings of his cabinets, which contained natural history specimens. This is uh, yet another cabinet. This is in Halle, Germany and is perhaps the most complete survival of a cabinet of curiosities. It was begun in 1589, was enlarged in the 17th, and again in the 18th centuries, and had a teaching purpose, and has recently been restored. I've seen images of this restored, and it's, it's just gorgeous. I would love to go see it. The cabinets of curiosities were highly individualized collections of specimens and objects that reflected the owner's knowledge and curiosity about the world, as well as their wealth and power. Cabinets contained specimens that were collected from the natural world or from nature. These could include things like exotic specimens from far off lands that were being brought back in voyages of discovery, rare minerals, coral, shells, and fossils, medical preparations, and sports of nature, that strange term, such as conjoined twins or hermaphrodites. All of these objects were grouped in the broad category of naturalia, or the natural. But the cabinets also contained objects that were made by people, or that were modified by people in some way. Things like tools, coins, precious stones, set into metalwork, scientific instruments, and artifacts collected during voyages of discovery were all grouped into the category of artificialia. So in, in this slide, if you look at the, the, the um, tortoise, not the tortoise shell, ostrich egg, thank you, yeah, it was held up like there, the ostrich egg that is set into this very elaborate metalworked container or chalice, you can see that there's coral, there's the ostrich egg, but then you also have all of this modification by people, so it would be an example of natural. Many other visual and written sources have inspired my cabinet of curiosity pieces. Among them are scientific illustrations. Collecting and the documentation of collections are at the heart of cabinets of curiosities in early museums. I'm interested in the ways that scientific illustrations represent views of the natural world, along with our universal need to categorize things. When I was an art history student, this was not you would not study things like the history of scientific illustration. It was something that was not at all considered worthy of study by an art historian. <coughs> now it's, um, it is, which I'm really pleased to see. So perhaps some of you who are in art, art history are, are learning about some of this kind of stuff. These are two views of a taxidermy <coughs> shop in Paris which is still in existence, it's a very old shop, and it still looks like it is back there in the 19th century to me. And when I first saw these images, which are in a book of photography called Museology, the photographer is Richard Ross, and he went across the world and took photographs of museums. And I was really taken by these, and was influenced by the look, the way the objects were piled together, and, and just the look of these images in some of the work I was making, or thinking about making. 
Here you see two views of 19th century taxidermy bird mounts in natural history museums. I'm particularly interested in birds, as you'll see. And on the left is a case of birds from the Museum of Natural History in Paris. This display reflects 19th century collection and museum display practices where a large number of specimens from a single species were displayed together to show variations across the species. To our contemporary eyes, we see this and we think this is a horrendous waste of animal life, but if you go into the back rooms of natural history museums now, you'll still see thousands and thousands of specimens. So when people come in to study, they're still looking at this variation. The right slide shows two swans from Booth's Bird Museum in Brighton, England, which was an early 1800s natural history museum. Another important theme in much of my recent work is the beauty and transience of life and the idea that we are the same substance as the rest of the natural world. These ideas are a recurring theme in much early scientific writing and illustration. If you look at these two, these two pages, you see the fragility of and the beauty of live flowers juxtaposed with the dead bird, for example. So you're seeing this comparison between life and death and the fragility of life. I think these references to the power and fragility of life are part of the reason that I have drawn so strongly to these types of illustrations. One of the 18th century scientists that I looked at in this regard is a guy named Frederick Rausch. Rausch developed new methods for preserving human and animal parts and kept them very secret. He documented many of his discoveries and preparations in his four volume folio, Opera Omnia, and there's a copy of this folio at UW in their medical rare books library that I've looked at it and scanned from it over the years. Also, a lot of his anatomical specimens still exist. And considering that they're from the mid-1700s, this is pretty amazing. What really intrigues me about Rausch is his Baroque sensibility, as evidenced in these anatomical preparations. So for example, the baby's arm that you see on the left is one of his preparations that still exists. The baby's arm is holding an eye socket, you know, since this very dramatic presentation. And he really looks at this with reverence and with an eye to his beauty. So he's dressed this arm in this, this linen sleeve with a lace cuff. The two Suriname toads that you see on the other side are engravings done after his preparations. They are preserved in jars with these odd little still-like tableaus on the tops, which really fascinate me. So Roish thought a lot about how these specimens were going to look. And, elevated the whole um, idea of specimen preparation to an art form. Rausch was not alone in this sensibility, which celebrates the sweetness and intricacy of life in the most unexpected ways. These anatomical mannequins, which were made in France in the 17th century to teach anatomy, are beautifully constructed from ivory and housed in their own little box coffin sort of forms. This is a full-scale anatomical teaching model of a pregnant woman from the famous collection of wax anatomical models from La Speckle in Florence, made around 1775. I don't find these anatomical models and preparations macabre. The combination of sensuality, beauty, and realism is what I find compelling about them. I also think it's really interesting that now, in the last 10 or 15 years, there have been these big traveling exhibitions of full-scale anatomical preparations, and people are flocking to see them. Those I do find kind of macabre, and I think they raise moral questions, but somehow for me the wax, wax ones don't. Another true cabinet of curiosities that I continue to explore are the collections at the State Historical Society of Wisconsin. Our collections here include a very fine archive of 19th and 20th century photography, and the prints that you see here were made from glass plate negatives made in the 1870s. They show farm scenes from South Central Wisconsin. These are really dear to my heart, because this is where I live, and I really care about this area, this landscape. 
So thinking about all that I've showed you for the last several minutes, I had all of these sources in mind when I started to think about making my own cabinets. And the first one that I did, which in some ways is my favorite, is called my Arcadia. You see it here. I did it in 2000 for a show at what is now the Chazen Museum of Art. It was in the Elgin Museum in Madison, which had four artists in it. It was called Four Artists, Four Visions. And each of us designed and then raised some grant money to have constructed a cabinet. And then we filled the cabinet with whatever we chose to fill it with. For my cabinet, I combined assemblages of found and constructed objects, photographs, and text, trying to show viewers how I use visual and written sources to explore themes of life, death, and rebirth. So really, it was an exploration of myself. The cabinet has a display vitrine on top, and it has drawers that can be opened and explored. The vitrine contains three glass or three trees that are fabricated from bronze, wood, and graphite, housed in Victorian glass domes that I bought from eBay. Three of them survived, two of them broke in the mail. The trees show the stages of life, birth on the left, fluorescence, or you know, the full flowering of midlife, and death on the right. The detail that you see is of the, the middle tree. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to show you a few interiors of drawers. The images on the left come from prints made from slides at the archives of the State Historical Society. The two, the two twins that died of diphtheria involved in another farm scene below. For me, my Arcadia is my world in a cabinet. It's a compendium of ideas and things that interest me and inform me as an artist. And as I worked on it, it really made me think about what was important to me and about how I might try to explain it to other people. This piece is on display right now in the new addition to the Chazen Museum of Art in Madison, which just opened a couple of weeks ago. So if you haven't seen it, make the trip over to see the new museum. It is really, I'm really impressed with it. It's very, it's very elegant and beautiful, and, and there's so much more work out than has ever been able to be put on view for a lot of new pieces as well. And my piece is in a room which is uh, dedicated to Midwest magic realism. So I, I now have been defined. I am a Midwest magic realist and proud of it. This drawer is in the back side of the cabinet. It's kind of a secret drawer. A little harder to look at than most of the other drawers. And fifth graders in Madison, that was, I've been told by the, by the docents at the museum, because this piece was out for a number of years, and it was like, this is the drawer that kids come to find. It's a dead cat drawer. But when I was writing about, or doing this, doing this drawer, I was thinking about death and how people look at death and possibilities of rebirth. And I found a quote by the, by the writer and art critic Arthur Danto. He wrote an essay called Beauty and Morality. And in that, he said, a typical human response to death is to use beauty as a kind of catalyst, transforming raw grief into tranquil sadness by putting the loss into a universal philosophical perspective. Part of my intent with my Arcadia and much of my other work is to use beauty and the creation of art to better understand and express my own feelings about the transience of life. I hope that these pieces touch on universal human feelings as well. When the Jason purchased my Arcadia right after that show was done, I was, I was thrilled that they bought it because I wanted it to be an museum collection. But I also was, I, I wanted to live with it for a while and learn from it. So I thought, well, I'm going to just try to make another cabinet, see if I can make something that I like. I don't like this one nearly as well, but I made it, which was a really good thing. This is called What Every Woman Ought to Know, and was in the show at the Nobel Summit. It's built into a found cabinet. I do a lot of searching for objects and use, it, use found objects in my work. This was a cash register cabinet without the cash register, which I modified. The drawers contain assemblages of tools, 19th century cabinet card photographs of young women, 
etched plates taken from 19th century books, written for artists that describe emotions and physiognomy. So lots of things that either directly or metaphorically show how women were regarded or told to act in the 19th century. But part of the image you see on the right is a, a bustle form, which I built after a patent, <clears throat> excuse me, a patent model. So it's a very direct rendition of a Victorian woman's bustle, which looks like two wings. I hung a little raccoon spine with a plumb bob coming out the bottom, so it's a very straight backbone, as it should be. Here's a view of the cabinet with two of the drawers open. The drawer on the left, you might be interested in this detail, refers to experiments done by a 19th century French physiologist named Duchin de Boulogne. Dr. Duchin, some of you may know about this guy, he used electrical current to stimulate the face, facial muscles of his human subjects, noting which groups of muscles acted together to create facial expressions that reflect different emotions. So as a scientist, he was really quantifying what muscles would create a frown, what muscles would create a smile of happiness. But he was zapping people with current, and some of his subjects, and then photographing them. And some of his subjects came from one of the insane asylums in Paris. I don't know where this little girl came from, but you can still see these, these photographs. And what really interests me is that he published these photographs for both physicians and artists. So he was feeling like artists could really learn from these photographs how to better model a human face as sculptors if he could help quantify exactly which muscles acted together. So that interplay between art and science Scientists doing things for artists and vice versa really fascinates me. This drawer shows a pair of First Communion photographs. There's a, a detail. I have a whole collection of these early or late 19th and early 20th century photographs. And certainly these kinds of photographs represent a major passage in a, a young woman's life if, if you're Catholic. But they also, I think, really show the, um, you know, the naivete of a young woman at this age. I surrounded the photographs with a wreath of deer ribs with bound birch branches cast into metal with buds on them. Some of the drawers are filled with tools or things that allude to tools. This one has tools that could be used for measuring, for applying makeup or for storing potions. The drawer contains two masks. I've got a detail that you see a mask on the upper left. These were made after an illustration in Diderot's Encyclopedia from the 1700s. It's an encyclopedia of technology, but it has a page on barbering, which shows masks that look like this that people would put over their faces when applying powder to their wigs. If you didn't want to take your wig off, you put a mask on that they're really beautiful forms. So some of these tools are maybe more obvious if you know tools. Some are very enigmatic. I want them to be suggestive of different things. I've also made some smaller pieces that are inspired by collecting the cabinets and curiosities. This piece is called The Structures of Being. It's built into Victorian frames, these very ornate frames that I've been built shadow boxes behind, so they're about two feet by a foot and a half each and maybe six inches deep. They reflect the division of the natural world, which you often see in historical cabinets, into animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdoms. So you get the animal on the left, the vegetable or plant in the center, and mineral on the right. I've used powdered graphite in many of my pieces. The cat, for example, was covered with powdered graphite. The pigeon skeleton and the other bones are covered with graphite. The graphite serves several purposes for me. It both masks and emphasizes form. It has the power to transform objects and to give them new meaning. And the color and richness of the graphite, for me, pays homage to 18th and 19th century engraved scientific illustrations where you have beautiful laid paper and you see the imprint of the, the um, 
plate as it goes through the press, so you see all this texture, and then you know the really beautiful deep colors of the ink. So I feel like the graphite helps to create that feeling. I've also thought a great deal about why so much of my work is made to look used and old, either through the use of actual antique objects or through the aging of new materials through patinas and distressing. For a while, I felt like I really had to defend that. With being a contemporary artist, I had to defend that feeling, oh, it makes it look too decorative or too pretty. Now I just kind of ignore it because it's what I want to do. But I have thought about it a lot. And part of the reason why it interests me is that age, for me, confers a beauty and an authority of objects that they might not otherwise have. As the artist, another artist, who was a contemporary artist, Buzz Spector, has said about using old objects in his work, since objects have no capacity to defend themselves, we see in their survival the evidence of others' care. History displaces objects. Objects fall out of history all the time. And in the circumstances of art, an object moves into another history. And I certainly think about that a lot if I use something like a skeleton or a found object. I think of it taking on a new meaning in an art piece. This is the center detail. Another cabinet of curiosities exhibition that I've worked on is Loca Miraculi, or the Rooms of Wonder, which is currently installed at the Milwaukee Art Museum in the American Galleries. I knew I'd lose my voice at some point too. Have some of you seen this? Been down to see it? Yeah, please. Rooms of Wonder was, was a, a really different challenge for me. After Starry Transit, the exhibition that made Bruce crazy was up, the guy who's the director of the Chipstone Foundation, John Crown, came to see it. And he decided at that point he would ask me to try to develop a Cabinet of Curiosity show at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And asked me if I'd be interested. I did not hesitate. I said, well, yeah, I am your person. I would really like to do that. I was thrilled to be asked. <clears throat> in case you don't know anything about the Chipstone Foundation, which probably most of you don't, it's based in Milwaukee and has the collection that is from the Boston Store family. And it's a world-class collection. It's really been built up over the years of early American furniture and British and American ceramics going back to the mid-1600s, throughout the 1700s, and into the early 1800s. So the idea was I would work with those ceramics and furniture pieces, choose, choose some of them, develop artworks and other contextual material around them while creating an installation that would be my modern perspective as an artist on historical cabinets of curiosities. So I started working on this. I had some ideas I was very excited about. Talked to John about them and the other curators who were working on it at the museum. John really was liking my ideas. Instead of having it be a three and a, month, three and a half month exhibition, which it was going to be, he said, you know, it's really time we should reinstall all those American galleries. Let's make this a permanent exhibition. And aren't you thrilled with that? And it was kind of a good and bad thing for me because I'm also a curator, and I knew that that would change what I would be able to do in some ways. I would lose some control over it because they would have their own agenda, which would be pretty important for an exhibition that would be out for a number of years, which I understood. But certainly, a good thing about it was that I had a long time to work on it, and it probably quadrupled the budget. So I had this large budget, which I will never ever have again to work on a show. So that was really fun. It was really a collaborative project that took about three years to put together. So here you see the entrance. Rooms of Wonder is installed in three adjoining galleries. The three galleries are conceived as one cabinet of curiosities. There are also cabinets, freestanding cabinets in the normal sense within each room. So it really is cabinets within cabinets within cabinets. Each gallery has a separate emphasis 
and theme, but the underlying ideas repeat and flow between all of the rooms, and really the underlying ideas about how people observe nature and develop artwork from it. In the first room, there are two prominent characteristics found in Cabinet of Curiosities that are reflected, and we've talked about both of them. One is the division of the natural world into the animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdoms, and the second is a comparison between artifacts and materials from the natural world and objects made from these materials between artificialia and naturalia. All three of the cabinet tableaus compare the artificial, which are the furniture pieces from chipstone, with the natural, the specimens and materials collected from the natural world. So when you enter the room, you see this little document cabinet, which is made out of wood, surrounded by a whole bower of wooden branches. There are decayed elm branches and then budded out elm branches. So again, it speaks to the transience of life and cycles of life, but it's also wood. And wood is what you use to make the cabinets. There's an animal cabinet that you see here, my favorite one. The curators and I wanted this room to be what they called, and curator lingo, an experiential space, meaning that it should really be dramatic. It should make you feel like you are not in the museum anymore. You've gone into a different kind of place. It Want, it needed to be crowded and dark, you needed to weave your way through it. And so far people have been very, you know, sort of wonderfully careful with it. There are all kinds of branches you can break off and roosters you can pick up, and, and people are being very respectful, which I'm happy about. The deer that you see here is a um, hermaphrodite. It's a doe with antlers, and is on loan from a friend of mine who inherited her in the basement of his hardware store in Mazomani, where he had a studio. And she was taxidermied and taken on parades in Mazomani, but now she's been graphited and is in the, the museum for a few years. She would have been a curiosity really sought after for cabinets. So it's, it's great we found her. The design of the mineral cabinet with objects spilling out onto the floor and drawers was inspired by the engravings that I showed you way back at the beginning of Levinas Spencer's Cabinet of Curiosities. So I was thinking a lot about historical cabinets when I designed these rooms. The second room has ceramics in it. There's a question. Are you allowed to touch everything? No, you aren't. That's a good question. Are you allowed to touch everything? <laughs> so when you go into the second room, you can, you can open drawers in the cabinets. And people don't necessarily understand that unless there are a couple of drawers open or unless a guard comes in or unless people are opening drawers. But you can't touch things anywhere else. So you can't touch the cabinets in the first room. And they're up on plinths, so they're away. You know, it's hard for you to touch them. But that was something they were really concerned would happen. And it hasn't been a problem. Although I do remember on the opening night, somebody went out to that document cabinet and she tried to pull the drawers open and they were waxed in place. So they didn't come off, but yeah, so far it's been okay. So the second room is really a much more didactic room. All of the drawers that are in the five cabinets are telling you something about the ceramics up above. <coughs> me. The cabinets were designed and made by the Wisconsin furniture maker, Jim Dietz. So again, I said this was really a collaborative project. This is a huge commission for Jim. The designs were inspired by cabinets in a 17th century cabinet of curiosities in Vienna. Each cabinet has a theme. The underlying theme for all five is the relationship between the ceramic pieces displayed and observation of the natural world. So viewers can open drawers in the cabinets, revealing natural history prints, other ceramic pieces, assemblages of objects, text, and prints that explore connections between the ceramics science, material culture, fine art from the time in which the ceramics were made, and so on. Some of the drawers have sound, which is at a pretty high level, so when you open the drawers, people tend to jump. <laughs> There's a, a drawer with video, there are drawers with lights. So we hope that this would be an engaging and kind of a, a multimedia experience. The fossils and egg cabinet that you see here is filled with ceramics that are made to look like specimens that came out of the ground. 
My two favorite pieces out of all the ceramics in their collection are these two teapots that are glazed to look like they're made out of fossils. Beginning in the 17th century, British collectors became fascinated with what they called fossil stones, which were being found throughout England as people were digging them up around the coasts of England. People didn't know what fossils were. They had no idea where they came from. You know, so did they come from God? Did, you know, what, was there a flood? What was the deal? So they didn't understand them. By the mid-18th century, this interest in fossil stones was reflected in architecture and the decorative arts, and a few enterprising potters who thought they could make some money off the phenomenon started painting fossil patterns onto teapots. There's a drawer right underneath the teapots which has examples of the actual fossils, which are pictured on the teapots, because you can tell what they are, as well as text and images taken from John Hill's book, A General Natural History, published in London in 1748, which shows examples of those fossils. And he has quite a bit of writing in there about, you know, what are fossils? We just don't know. So it's interesting to read. The third room contains several optical illusions that were popular in the 16 and 1700s. Perspective illusions were developed along with perspective drawing during the 1500s and 1600s. And it's really interesting to me, as, as soon as people figured out mathematical ways to help artists and architects render depth in what they thought was a more um, naturalistic manner, people started taking those mathematical ideas of perspective and inverting them and skewing them so that you could produce distorted views of reality. This all seems to me to fit into the whole cabinet of curiosity's construct. These illusions make us question and wonder. They combine the natural and the artificial. They have an element of secrecy about them. It could be used to express a political position or to make a pornographic or scatological joke to a select group of viewers. And many of the, the anamorphic illusions you see are, are pornographic or scatological. The long wall illusion that you see in the background uses an image of a cabinet of curiosities. It's Ferrante Imperato's cabinet from Italy in the, I think, 16th, 17th century. We all like the idea of using a cabinet within a cabinet as one of the illusions. With all of these illusions, there's a special sweet spot you have to look at to get the illusion to come into the proper perspective to get it unskewed again. And for the long wall illusion, there's a pedestal with a little viewer in it with an eye hole in it. And if you go to that point, it'll, and you can kind of see in the lower right of the slide, get an idea of what it looks like when you see it through the eyepiece. I don't have much chance to go down and watch people go through the show, but sometimes I do stop in there and watch people look at that wall illusion and they all go, ah, you know, which is just the reaction you hope to get with that. For me, again, as an artist doing research, this was great fun because I wanted to make anamorphic and mirror illusions for a number of years, and now I was being given a reason to figure out how to make them. I'd love to do an exhibition which is all illusions like this, hanging from the ceilings, coming up from the floor, coming up from the wall. So hopefully I'll do that one in these years. This third room has three anamorphic illusions. You see one on the screen. The anamorphic illusions use some sort of a mirrored surface, a cylinder or a cone, and there's a skewed illusion that's kind of wrapped around that cylinder. And when you get, again, just at the right spot, when you walk up to the cylinder and you're just at the right eye height, you'll see the illusion come back into its proper proportions. The images that I use for these come from a book by Robert John Thornton, called The Temple of Flora. It's a very large-scale folio, really beautiful book published in 1812, and Chipstone has a copy of this very rare book. So please go down and see it if you have a chance. I've been told this will be up for two more years. And hopefully I'll get that whole flock of chickens back to do something with. For the last part of the talk, I want to show you a few other recent pieces that build up my interest in the history of natural history and cabinets and curiosities. And I have to thank the UWM photographer who photographed my show last summer, because he provided these images 
of the Kakatu. I don't know if he's here today, but if you are, you're using your images. <coughs> Excuse me. The first two pieces, which were in the show at Anova, are mirror illusions that are built into circular boxes. They're based on 17th century mirror boxes and other types of mirror illusions, where multiple mirrors are positioned in enclosed spaces to create endless confusing vistas. And again, you have to get it to the right height to really see the repeat in the vista. Contemporary artists such as Joseph Cornell and Lucas Samaras have continued to work with this, this idea. Now they have a, a room, a mirror room installed in the Milwaukee Art Museum. I don't know offhand the name of the artist, but I think it dates to the 60s. This piece is called Mouse King and was inspired by stories about natural history specimens of tangled skeletons of baby rats whose tails became intertwined when they were in the nests. So they died in the nest because they couldn't unknock themselves and get out. I don't know if this is an old wives' tale, old husband's tale, whatever, but I decided I needed to make a piece called Mouse King since I had mouse skeletons. And my truly anal compulsive nature helped me to put all these little moss bones together into these skeletons. This is the companion piece. This is called Silver Forest, another mirror illusion. And when you look inside, you see a cut over forest, which is starting to bot again, and there are bees in it. So again, it's, it's speaking to the possibility of, of resurrection and, and ongoing life. I often incorporate found objects into my pieces to help to develop the narrative, blurring the boundaries between what is found and what is fabricated by me. The idea for this diptych started with a pair of found tintype photographs from the mid to late 19th century. These are also shadow box pieces built into to, um, Victorian vintage frames. Someone asked me this morning if I considered these cabinets of curiosities. I don't really, but I started making them after I made the cabinets with assemblages and drawers. And I thought, you know, any of these drawers could be made into an art piece that hangs on the wall. It'd be quicker, you know. So I started purchasing these frames, looking for them, and, and making some share box pieces. I think that the boy and girl in these tin types are a brother and sister, although who knows? There are no names on them. Each photograph becomes part of a tableau of text and objects that show areas of natural history study deemed appropriate in the Victorian period for boys and girls. And I, I really would like viewers to think about what do we still think is appropriate for boys and girls, as we sure do have things we think are appropriate, unfortunately. The boy is surrounded with mouse skeletons, bones, and an etched copper list of taxidermy tools needed for a field study kit. I found this list in a 19th century book on taxidermy I purchased to help me figure out how to put skeletons together. The girl sits on a table below an etched text excerpt from Robert John Thornton's book, The Temple of Flora, which I just talked about. That book, published in 1818, uses poetic, highly sexualized descriptions of plants throughout. It reflects the NASA's plant classification system based on the sexual reproduction of plants. That was a whole new idea before to think that plants had a sex life. People were quite fascinated by that. And to me, the descriptions of the plants could so much describe a, a, a description of a proper woman at that period that I wanted to combine a girl with one of those descriptions. Sama for my mother was made after my mother died. My mother and father really encouraged my interest in nature and collecting. I was quite a tomboy as a kid, and as a little girl, I amassed a large collection of cow bones that I found in the woods and the, the fields around the house, intending to assemble them into a mounted cow skeleton with my childhood friend, Kathy. And Kathy's mom had an old Victorian china cabinet in the basement. We put all the bones in the cabinet, and now I look back and think, how oh, weird was that? I was making cabinets of curiosities when I was eight. My parents saved all those bones for me until I graduated from college, and I remember they called me up and said, we're going to sell a house, 
what should we do with your collection of problems? I was amazed they still had them. And they said, scatter them down the hill for another child to find. So that's true parental love. Each section of Summa is constructed in a wreath shape, echoing morning wreaths and Victorian hair and seed wreaths. The insects, cocoons, bones, and cicadas are symbols of the fragility of life and the possibility of resurrection. So this was a memorial for my mom. For the last few years, I've been looking at mounted herbarium plant specimens and doing reading about the spread of plant and animal specimens through collecting expeditions. For example, the spread of plants from colonial America to Europe. I'm interested in the narrative possibilities of combining text which alludes to the bits of paper used to tie down plants and herbarium specimens when they're drying. So in my case, I'm putting text onto the paper, thinking about how I could work with the text in an emotional and narrative way with constructed plants tied down in confined spaces. The first piece I made, which I finished in the summer and put in a show at Inova, is called Collinson's Rapture you see here. It uses text from letters written in the 1600s between the naturalist John Bartram, who was living in Pennsylvania, and Peter Collinson, a um, British shipping magnate who was shipping stuff back and forth between the colonies in England, and also was having plants shipped back to him. He was a plant collector. I was partly inspired to do Images like this, looking at things like this Victorian herbarium album page where you see text, sometimes it's poetry, sometimes it tells you where the plant was collected, but oftentimes the plants are inserted into the paper in really interesting ways or are tied and pinned down in ways that visually really interest me. These are uh, pages from one of Hans Sloan's herbarium album. Sloan was a, a naturalist from England who was collecting specimens in the 1700s. He's a very famous, famous scientist. And the basis of his collections, be, or his collections became the basis of the British Museum. Many of these specimens are now in the Sloan Herbarium at the Natural History Museum in London. And I was lucky enough to weasel my way in there last fall to have an appointment with these, which was really important to me in thinking about this work. I'm going to show you details from two of the framed plants with bits of the text describing the emotional aspects of collecting that are contained in these pieces. The text is etched into copper with the text raised in black, so it has a lot of dimension. So these emotional aspects, which I can really relate to while collecting, include the thrill of the hunt, the satisfaction of finding a rarity, and the frustrations and joys of establishing a rare species in a new environment. For the, the center one of these, or center panel of the triptych, the text says, and again, this is Peter Collinson writing this, for I waited all, almost all of my lifetime before to get this rare flower. I read of it and seen it figured in books, but despaired of ever possessing it. And then on the right, it continues, my botanic genius carried me into a garden where I expected to find nothing. On a sudden, my eyes was ravished with the sight of this flower, and my heart leaped for joy that I should find it at last. And in the first, first section of the, the, uh, the triptych, he's actually really scolding John Bartram for letting plants that Peter Collinson had sent back to him die and saying, never again will I cast my pearls before a swine, basically. And so he's, he's just a very entertaining and interesting writer who's being studied by various history of science people. Finally, I want to show you Deconstructing Flight. This also was in the show at Nova, and is an homage to the 19th century French physiologist and photographer, Etienne Jules Marais. Marais was working in Paris at the same time as the photographer Edward Moybridge was working in San Francisco. I know a lot of you are familiar with Moybridge. Moybridge developed a gun camera that was able to take enough exposures per second to stop certain kinds of motion. He published photographs of moving animals, of people performing motions such as running and walking upstairs, getting up off a chair, and so on. 
like Moybridge, Murray developed a stop action camera. They were, they were um, friends, but also competitors. And Murray published many photographs of his motion studies. Murray's work had a great influence on artists such as Marcel Duchamp, if you think of New Descending a Staircase, and of the futurist Umberto Bocioni with a with the walking dog. They both paid homage to Murray. But as a physiologist, Murray was gifted at developing machines that measured forces used in muscle movements and the flow of fluids in the body. He developed the first blood pressure cuff and did studies with birds that measured the dynamics of flight. So here you see an, um, an engraving after one of the apparatus, apparati that he developed, apparatuses, whatever. And here is another view. I'm really fascinated by how scientists like Murray develop ways to measure and quantify things. And I'm also really drawn to these images. This is a photograph of Murray's mechanical bird. When I saw this, I decided that I wanted to make a bird automaton. At first, though, I made this piece called The Persistence of Nature. The photographic inset in the background is from one of Murray's photographs of a tethered bird in flight. And this very dead bird has also been tethered. And then last year, I made Deconstructing Flight which, to my mind, imagines a scientist studying the mechanics of flight. The bird skeleton is a hybrid of a goose and a wild turkey. I picked up those bones, didn't have a complete turkey or a complete wild goose, so I put them together, and built an armature for it, supported it on a lab stand. And then, believe me, this is not easy for me, I'm not a mechanically inclined person, but I built a whole gear set up so that I can crank the, the gear at the bottom center of this thing, all the wheels will move and the bird's wing will go up and down in sort of a jerky simulation of a bird in flight. I was very proud of myself. And I think people were frustrated in Nova that they couldn't get up there and turn that crank. The cockatoo was given to me by a friend who raises parrots and cockatoos. I get all sorts of interesting gifts from my friends. This is Ruffles, who was one of his favorite birds. When she died after becoming egg-bound, he gave me her body to give her a new life as a taxidermy specimen in an art piece. And I showed, I, I sent him an image back of Ruffles as a white taxidermy cockatoo, and he wrote back and he said, I can't bear to look at her. So I may have failed my friend, but I think she looks great. The photograph in the background is one of Murray's stop action images of a bird's wing in flight, and then I showed it in a couple of those images. That is it. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, thanks for being so great. Yes, a question. Yeah, I have a question. I love your work. Um, I'm wondering, within your research, if you've contacted or met along the way any um, scientists that are interested in documenting their work in artful ways. I ask this because I teach a visual journals class, and in the past I had a student from the University of Min uh, Minnesota who was a, a, a medical student, and he wanted to document his research in an artful way. So I'm wondering if, you've just, if you have any stories of people who you've met that are using some of these practices to document their research? I'm not sure I understand exactly what you mean. Just, I'm, I'm wondering if you've met anyone from other fields, not art fields, right. that are documenting their research in very artful ways. Oh, in very artful ways. Yeah. I really, what I'm, one thing I'm trying to do now is to really forge relationships with working scientists. I have a lot of relationships with history of science people, but I'm going to be doing some work with scientists who are actually doing contemporary research, like I know Lane and Lisa have done. And yes, they are. I mean, I, 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 I was involved in a show last year, helping, or a couple of years ago, helping to put together a show of images that scientists are taking. They were all microscopic images of research that they were doing. And it was interesting to me 
how many of the scientists felt very strongly about the either the beauty of those images or the artistic content of those images. And they wanted to enter them into this exhibition that was shown in Madison and National Public Radio picked up the story about that and this exhibition has been traveling around. So certainly in that sense they are, and I know that I, from talking with scientists that they're really interested in what I'm doing, that I'm, I'm interested in talking to them and learning about their work, but also in how scientists have worked with artists before, whether they're illustrators or not. And I think many scientists are really concerned that they have a good illustrator, someone who can really make their work understandable, but also create illustrations that have artistic merit. Yeah. And if you look at the whole history of scientific illustration, to me it's fascinating. And I think a lot of those illustrations really certainly make you want to learn about what's being shown, but also they just are weird or, and or beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think they really provide a unique way to access that research, you know, yes. for people who aren't yeah. in the field. That's great. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. You were talking about these collaborations between scientists and artists. I think, and I see you work, and I think Rosamund Purcell and Stephen Cole. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, well, you mentioned Rosamund Purcell and Stephen Jay Gold. And Rosamund Purcell is a photographer, and for quite a number of years, she's been going into natural history collections and different museums in the world and photographing, and she collaborated with Stephen Jay Gold on several books. And Rosamund Purcell was the person who was contracted to recreate Ole Worms Cabin. I was trying to remember who the artist was, and it was Rosamund Purcell. So I was really inspired by her. I became aware of her before we worked on the Cabinet of Curiosity show at the Chase and we got her to come and speak. So she was somebody, just her example encouraged me to think that you could make overtures to scientists and see if there was a way that you could initiate a collaboration. So yes, I, I really am interested in that. Yeah. Any, yes? What was that exhibition? It's called Tiny. And they were all images from the UW Madison campus, mostly the um, natural sciences, biological sciences, medical sciences. Any other questions? Um, I try to think of a, 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 a kind of um, short, the short version of this question. But um, your, your piece at the museum in, in, the, in the room where you could actually go in and open the drawers and, and um, you know, discover the cabinet in a way that one can if one goes to any of those collections at, at the kind of old school museums where they do have those things and they are intended for you to open them up, although contemporary people often don't feel that they, they can have those interactions. That, that, that's how they were, they were designed in, in, in their original intention. Um, that the, the physicality of those drawers was a really beautiful experience, and, and I fell in love with the mechanism of those drawers, and, and the, the, um, yeah. you know, to the extent that we, I was like, ooh, I want those drawers. You know, I, I love how those drawers work. But, but it also occurred to me that, that opening drawers and opening cabinets and opening cupboards is just something that we do every day. And, and my day is filled with opening cabinets that don't work properly. They make horrible sounds or they, they're rickety. You know, the, the, the horrible chest of drawers in my son's room that I have to yank open and shove clothes in. And then, you know, it, 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 it doesn't function right. Yeah. And, and I, I wondered if you thought at all about, or maybe you don't care about this, but, but thought, thought at all about what it meant not only to allow people to open the drawers and experience the the, the, the kind of recontextualizing of what you see always with what you discover, also with the physicality of what it means to open that drawer. So, so there is a drawer that, that opens beautifully, and with a gentle shove, it kind of closed itself, which was how these drawers worked at the museum. They were a thing of beauty. 
but, but also the, the drawers that don't work so well, and, or the ones that are accompanied with uh, you know, sounds or, yeah. or other kinds of, of things in that mundane interaction that we all experience. I thought a lot about the drawers, and the first the first piece that I made where you could open drawers was the pieces in the Jason collection, and I worked with um, a furniture conservator, Ian Gale, built that cabinet, and he made dovetail drawers. I wanted the cabinet to be built like a mid 19th century cabinet. It was modeled on the cabinets, sort of, at the Natural History Museum in Paris. And so we made the drawers so they would look like 19th century drawers. And they don't have that ice closing mechanism, but they work really well. But they have glass on the top, you know, so you can take them apart and fix them if you need to, but there's glass on the top so you can open them and people can't mess with the stuff inside. And I remember when I showed that, that the museum director, Russell Petchenko, was so nervous about this. He said, I don't know, you know, we have insurance and stuff, but I'm afraid this piece is really going to be damaged and people will be opening these drawers. And the piece was very well made, you know, so people could open the drawers. And that was the piece people wanted to, because you could mess with it. You could open the drawers. And there's such power in opening a drawer and maybe what you see in there, like this pair of beautiful dead babies, you don't want to see. You know, and I knew that there was this whole element of secrecy and discovery with this whole act of opening the drawers. And when I realized how powerful that was, I really wanted to have something like that here at the museum at MAM. And I love the drawer mechanism that Jim did, but I thought, part of me thought, this is too modern, you know? This is brand new stuff that you can buy out of a real high-end cabinet, hardware catalog, and it's not appropriate for a cabinet of curiosities. But I thought, just get over it. You know, it's got to be something that's going to withstand tons of visitors for a long period of time. And people love the drawers. And I've had lots of people ask me, what's the mechanism that I've had to find out from Jim? So yeah, I have thought a lot about that. And I want the drawers to function really well. And now that that piece is out of the chase, and again, I'm, I'm happy to see the drawers are still functioning really well. So. Drawers. Yes. What is an example of one of the women-like explanations of the plants that you have in your work? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. The explanation of um, the women-like plants. The women-like plants. Um, Did you want to know the name of the book? No, the guy explained it when they gave them uh, the plants, like women-like features, to explain what they looked like. It was in the um, the piece with the. Great. Right. Right. So the the descriptions came from the book called The Temple of Flora, and the man that that wrote the book, he was writing in this very flowery, almost to me, sappy, poetic text. A lot of it. The plant descriptions were less that way, but part of that text. I mean, he's talking about for a plant to be fine, you know, the scape, which is a botanical term must be straight and da 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 and all this kind of stuff. But he was, you know, it's this very beautiful description, but it's it's poetic and it it, it does have to me these really female qualities, because he's talking about petals and and you know the sexual apparatus of the plant, which is both male and female. Does that does that help? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. But you might that book has been reprinted, and I bet your library has a copy. And if you're interested, you should look at some of the What's, this, what's the name of it? It's called The Temple of Flora. And the, the author's name is Thornton, Robert John Thornton, T-H-O-R-N-T-O-N. Any other questions? Probably some of you would like to know. <laughs> yes? I, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about, you mentioned with the, the piece where there was all the birds and the dead birds and the set and you know, our sensibility that we might be troubled by all these dead animals. And but there seems to be a lot of work that is, that looks at, at, you know, takes that kind of um, earlier sensibility about, uh, about you know, the oddities and the, and you mentioned the man a couple times, where that 
it's kind of a multi-part question, but one thing was thinking about like these collecting practices that now we find rather repellent, like collecting many, many birds to represent a species. And also how I feel about using things like like the dead cat, for the example. Cat is close to, you that know, you don't want to touch and yeah, and that like with that dead cat, I got that from a friend. And the cat so I got the whole history of this cat actually, but the cat was underneath the porch that was really mummified and def desiccated at that point. That was this porch was being repaired and Sock City, the little town here where I live, and the carpenters were pulling, they were pulling the boards off the porch and they saw this dead cat under there and they wouldn't work until somebody came and took that cat out. You know, so that's, what, and my friend called and said, hey, our neighbors, da da da, you want this cat? I said, yeah, we'll be right over with my box and my gloves and I took the cat and the carpenters went back to work <laughs> after their mom and do it, it was cool. But I, I'm really interested in, part of me is interested in things that people find hard to look at. When I had my intro to art history class and we were looking at art from the Middle Ages where you really saw bodies being eaten by worms, I was sort of fascinated by that. And I think, again, it goes back to all the sorts of things I collected as a child and not being afraid to pick up bones and look at that and think about it and think, yeah, this was an animal that was living. I think part of my whole personality is really interested in, in this whole sort of how do things work, and how does the natural world work, and not being afraid to dissect things. And it's not that I want to revel in that, but I think it's part of life, and we tend to not think about any of that. I use graphite on that cat. It's still shocking for people, but if you have a beautiful surface on it, people will look at it and maybe think about it in a different way. And. I, I would not, I, I can understand why all the birds were collected. I had a tour of the Zoology Museum on campus in Madison, and that's been around since, I think, the 1870s or 80s that museum was started. From a time period where they were getting lots and lots and lots of bird skins. And they still have them, you know, they're, they're preserved in arsenic, but there are drawers and drawers and drawers and drawers of them. And they're still really being studied and serving a purpose. And they're still collecting them, although not to that extent. But you can go in there and you can see a drawer of passenger pigeons. I don't know, I don't know how I feel about it. It's be kind of queasy. And I would never kill an animal, but I have no problem with unless it's really in a rotten state, picking up a roadkill animal and taking it into a taxidermist if it's one that I can use. I don't know if that answers